really quite pleased. My very good friend Ian Brody, who has an affiliation here with CSIS, is going to be moderating this panel on trade and development. We have uh, we have representatives from the World Bank Group. We have representatives from USAID. We have representatives from UPS and represented from Bombardier, Canadian uh, aerospace company. And uh, it's, I think it's going to be quite an interesting conversation. If you said to me what one of the biggest opportunities are in international development, it's going to be at the intersection of trade and aid. And when I think about the fact that Canada has reorganized its uh, to foreign affairs, trade and development ministry, I think this is a this is a, a golden opportunity for Canada. I think I know the United States is very enthusiastic as well, and it's it's going to require partnerships with the World Bank and other multilateral institutions, as well as working closely, very closely with the private sector. And I think we're going to be able to tease that out. This opportunity, the need for multi-sector partnerships and coordination, and um, the the opportunity in front of us if, if we get an agreement with the in in Bal the Bali getting the trade facilitation agreement in Bali. Ian, over to you. Thank you very much, Dan, for that introduction. And thank you, Dan, and the crew here at CSAS for uh, organizing this uh, uh, very fascinating uh, discussion today. Dan, in particular, I, I know Dan lives here in DC. He's, of, uh, of course, uh, 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 an American. His heart, however, is uh, spread across the Western Hemisphere from, uh, from Argentina to, uh, to Canada. And I appreciate that you've uh, brought this uh, very innovative organization here uh, to bear to this conference topic today. On the trade and development uh, uh, nexus, of course, this has been a, a, a discussion uh, with many developments over the course of a long period of time, made more urgent by the shift of global growth since 2008 towards uh, emerging markets. We had a discussion earlier referenced to the extraordinary youth of most of the emerging markets, and uh, I think we've understood for some time that there are win-wins here in this part of the agenda, <clears throat> including in particular because of the major development challenges around infrastructure, around energy, to a lesser extent around agriculture. These are areas where private sector mobilization certainly seems to be not only possible but doable. And there certainly, as the minister explained, tremendous government demand for, uh, for uh, further action on the trade side. But nonetheless, trying to put flesh on the bones of this agenda uh, on the official side has proven to be uh, 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 challenging. Uh, there are many areas of precise focus, but an overall uh, agenda here uh, sometimes has had some difficulty coming together. There have been efforts at the WTO, at the G20 table, at the OECD, and so forth. Dan mentioned with the merger in Canada of uh, foreign affairs and trade, uh, along with the development side, there seems to be a new opportunity here on the Canadian side Virginia, could I ask you perhaps to start us off here as a, a major Canadian bilateral partner, of course. <clears throat> How do we put the flesh on the bones here? If you had some recommendations for the Canadians trying to make use of this uh, new merger, how might you provide some, some guidance on that from your own experience? Thanks, Ian, and thanks, Dan. Uh, well, in, in a sense, in terms of, of, of concrete guidance, of course, I feel like being from USAID and having USTR being separate, that we're part of a dying breed here. If you look at Canada, Australia, uh, Denmark, the Dutch, and others. But, uh, but in terms of moving forward in the, in the trade and development space, uh, I think most people know we're, we're quite connected with our USTR colleagues um, here in the US. And we're particularly connected on our efforts related to the trade facilitation agreement. And as Dan referenced, the, the Bali deal. Let me give a little bit of context um, to that as, as we start off. Um, you had mentioned that there's been a lot of work in, in other places, the OECD and others. The OECD did a study in 2012 about the benefits of the trade facilitation agreement. And they highlighted that if countries implemented just four particular provisions there related to trade-related information and a couple of other things, that it would have a tremendous effect on trade volumes and, and trade costs. In fact, with just those four areas implemented, the OECD found that 14.5% uh, 
Yeah, there would be, excuse me, a 14.5 percent reduction in trade costs and uh, time to trade for low-income countries. For us in the development world, that's an area where we just don't get those kind of results, especially in such a narrow focus. So that's why for us the, the trade facilitation and trade facilitation itself is so important. I know Rich and David will, will probably talk about the importance of it from the private sector's point of view, but that, that is where the intersection comes in, because it is the private sector that trades goods every day across the border. So if, if the implementation efforts that we focus on and the trade and development uh, efforts don't mesh, we're not going to get the concrete results that are possible here. I think some of you know that the, that the trade facilitation agreement and the Bali deal is, has found a few difficulties in Geneva, but notwithstanding that, at USAID, we're continuing to move forward on the focus of streamlining borders. And we have done that for years. We've always said that we are doing that, and we do it particularly in the regional uh, trade context of Africa. I, I would like to note that many countries have moved forward vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Geneva situation, and 47 countries notified what's called Category A to the WTO, saying what they would implement upon entry into force. So those are 47 developing countries, 47 developing country members. So I think that's an important step. For us, that's provided valuable information. It's also provided valuable information to the, the private sector in terms of, of what's going to be needed. So we are the leaders in TCB in terms of, of new models. I think I'll stop there, Ian. Uh, it, I can go further into exactly what AID's doing, but I think maybe I've laid the groundwork for you there on, on why trade and development and the nexus. No, look, I think that's a, 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 an excellent uh, framework for the discussion. Richard, could I ask you maybe if you might speak a little bit about the, uh, about the business coalition here? Is there... Uh, how do we construct and fill out the business coalition? Are we reaching all the right places on that front? I'd be glad to comment on that. Uh, first of all, I gotta say, I'm excited to be here. I wanna thank Daniel and uh, the uh, Canadian minister for pulling this together and uh, the work you're gonna do here, Ian. Um, one thing's for sure, if, if this was easy, it'd be done right now. And I think that we're getting into some spaces that there's, there's going to have to be some changes the way we go about trying to deliver and, and accomplish the goals. But you know, to your specific question, and well, even before I get to that, if I could just kind of set the stage for a minute. Uh, you know, UPS is uh, one of four companies that are part of a global express association. So many of my comments are going to be centered around what we see uh, as a company and as part of the global express association. Uh, the four companies. You can think of the big four integrators with TNT and DHL and Federal Express and UPS, and we have an opportunity to employ close, collectively, well over a million people around the globe, and we provide services around the globe. So we have a really unique perch, I think, when you look at us collectively as a group, or if you look at our organization. Uh, UPS is, is one of the world's largest, perhaps the largest, customs brokerage. Uh, so we have an opportunity that our perch is really, I think, special, not that it's only special because of our scope and what we get to see. So as far as from a, a, a U.S. standpoint uh, in, in pulling businesses together, there is a coalition. Uh, it's uh, uh, set up and led through the Express Association of America along with USCIB, uh, the U.S. Chamber, uh, or, or some of the, the National Foreign Trade Council, NAMP. Some of those company or associations really try to bring the voice of what uh, we think trade facilitation might be. Some of the key objectives or some of the focus of the Business Coalition is to really zero in on what it is that we think needs to be done, and which is wonderful that we can share our voice on that as a stakeholder, and where we think it needs to be done. And I have to thank Virginia. They've been uh, very receptive to, to try to hear what we think, where the target spot should be, and what the areas we need to focus on. But uh, it, 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 the nice thing is what we're beginning to see early on here is that we do have a voice, and I think that's important. I think the minister said earlier that, you know, he wants to eliminate the view that the private sector is the bad guy, and I have to agree with that completely. I think that, you know, as I said, our position is pretty special. I think I'll have a chance to share with you some of the findings a little bit later this morning that we've come across and what we see. And uh, we just want to be, and we're glad to be at the table, and, and we're excited about the time that's ahead of us. We realize, again, that it's not going to be easy. It's going to be challenging. <coughs> Thanks. Oops. David, may I just uh, turn to Bombardier for a moment? When I think of uh, examples in particular from a Canadian base, 
of countries with major investments uh, in uh, developing countries that have really harnessed development potential. Bombardier would be at the top of that at the top of that list. And then, of course, Bombardier, we spoke earlier about the infrastructure challenges in development. Bombardier is, uh, is probably the key infrastructure company based in uh, Canada and selling into uh, all sorts of uh, developing markets with, with emerging urban challenges uh, uh, for moving people and moving goods. Well, the minister spoke about the Canadian private sector maybe uh, uh, with some work to do to harness some of these challenges. I, I, think, I think of Bombardier as one of the countries that has seized that opportunity. David, do you have any lessons or any uh, uh, challenges in the policy agenda you might see going forward for other firms in the same space? Well, uh, thank you, Ian. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here, and uh, thank you to CSIS for, uh, and the minister for, for putting this together. A great opportunity. Um, yeah, yeah you, you make a good point. Um, uh, take a step back a little bit about Bombardier. Um, we are a global manufacturer of planes and trains, uh, so mobility solutions. Um, and we are quite aggressive internationally uh, and have been for some time out of our Canadian and Quebec uh, routes. Uh, we've got about 70,000 people worldwide uh, across 48 countries. Uh, we actually have uh, 80 production and engineering centers uh, across 20 countries. So uh, from an international perspective, uh, the topic today is actually quite important to us. Um, when we started this, uh, when I started prepping for this, I was given the question, uh, how does the company think about development broadly? And boy, that's a broad question. And so I was talking to uh, some of my colleagues to get their, their thoughts. And, some were quite helpful, some looked at me like I was insane, and uh, others, uh, uh, others uh, provided inputs. But one guy uh, was actually quite interesting, and um, his response was, uh, you know, it's ingrained. Uh, we don't need to think about it. It's part of our DNA. And that's actually a pretty interesting point for a company like ours, and I think many companies, that um, you know, it's not about thinking regard, in regards of development. It's about, it's a part of the business. And for us, uh, our core business, as you mentioned, uh, planes, trains, uh, developing mobility solutions for uh, uh, all uh, nations, uh, regions, locales, uh, is, is, pretty, uh, is pretty tied to uh, uh, development objectives around the world. Basically, our products uh, support transportation networks uh, that ultimately support uh, uh, competitive economies, whether they're emerging or whether they're whether they're uh, established. So for us, um, it's been a long haul. I mean, we started uh, our international foray into the US, actually, in the 80s So, um, you know, with, with the rail business. And from there, we've gone into many other countries. So in terms of lessons learned, as you had uh, said, uh, lessons learned are, uh, are, 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 there's a multitude of lessons. But you know, the partnering piece, I think, is very important. Being able to engage governments, being able to um, engage academic institutions, uh, financial institutions, et cetera, very important to us. But also, one of our key strategic uh, pillars is uh, establishing local roots. So as we go into a market uh, that we think is important, it's not just about selling products, it's about putting down roots uh, that can be facilities, that can be people on the ground, that can be joint ventures, that can be supply chains. Um, that's very important to us, hence the 80 uh, production centers and across 20, 20 countries. Um, so uh, if there are lessons learned, I think, from our perspective, uh, one of the key ones is establishing presence in the markets that you are aiming at. And uh, um, while there are many others, I think that's probably the key one that we followed uh, over the years. Klaus, you've uh, taken over this new uh, position, this new organization uh, in what is already an established institution uh, in this space. I know you have long experience in the private sector side uh, of the development equation, but can you give us an idea at this early stage of the uh, new evolution of the World Bank in this space, what you see as the global standouts, the global opportunities, and the, and the role the bank and the multilaterals can bring here? Uh, thank, thank, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, it's uh, indeed very fitting that you uh, refer to the, uh, the merger, because in some way this uh, trade and competitiveness practice that uh, uh, that I'm part of uh, really only started coming together about three months ago. So um, I would say uh, a lot of lessons to be learned um, already. Um, but let me sort of set the broader context. I think the first one is, of course, that we see uh, two overriding goals driving this discussion. The first one is the elimination of poverty, and the second one is to increase shared prosperity. And 
I think we all agree that uh, there has been absolutely no country that has actually accomplished uh, any type of sustained growth without uh, um, uh, trade. And so in that sense, uh, this um, effort that we have in terms of uh, uh, promoting this, um, we start with the point of view, obviously governance, uh, governments are important partners for us. We see significant hurdles um, that private sector traders are actually facing, uh, inefficient border management procedures, uh, opaque rules and regulations. And all of this really impacts very negatively the ability for countries to compete. And uh, I think what really has uh, uh, in inspired us is uh, this new uh, trade facilitation reform agenda uh, that uh, I think a lot of us are um, uh, working on and hoping to come to fruition. Countries cannot change resource endowments and their, uh, their geography. But what they can do, and governments in particular can do, is they can take policy decisions to actually remove uh, many of the hurdles that are standing in the way. And that's where we are coming in. Uh, the bank has a portfolio of about $13 billion um, devoted to uh, aid for trade, half of which goes for trade facilitation. And our, this entire portfolio really covers a gamut of things, uh, in integrating countries into the global economy, uh, making supply chains more efficient, reducing costs, trade barriers, and unnecessary bottlenecks. When it comes to, since you asked me sort of what's our footprint, our footprint is about 200 professionals working in about 120 uh, off offices around the world. We have technical expertise. We work internationally, nationally, regionally. Uh, we have long-term relationship with um, the private sector as well as with governments. Um, and what is really motivating a lot of our discussion is the data source that we have that we bring to this, whether this is the doing business or the uh, um, global logistics performance index. Uh, that really sort of really sets the stage in terms of identifying where the opportunities are. Um, as far as the WTO agreement itself is concerned, we are uh, fully supportive. We think this is a very strong blueprint for us. Uh, and in fact, when we look back at the last 20 years of what it is that we have supported, uh, we see a lot of uh, coincidence of, um, of efforts. Um, we have about 120 projects in customs and border management that we have supported over the last 20 years. Um, and that often is sort of a, a real, very effective way then of talking um, what, is this, uh, what is required in terms of implementation capacity. So when it comes down to sort of our second leg uh, or third leg is really to focus very much in terms of building the capacity of governments to then take these measures. Um, we see some um, that are very effective. Uh, they have very uh, high payoffs, whether these are uh, more predictable trading regimes, um, establishment of trade facilitation committees, um, trade information panels, single source windows. So in other words, there is a real focus that we have, uh, irrespective of where the international uh, negotiations are, but we believe we want to get on with the job. And one of the first things that we have actually started, uh, just as this uh, new practice was created, uh, we set up in uh, July uh, a trade facilitation support program, together with um, uh, Australia, Canada, the European Commission, uh, Switzerland, Norway, and that sort of really giving us a, a foot uh, right in the door already in terms of providing the support. So there is a, a very strong momentum that we see going forward, uh, irrespective of what uh, of how long it will take in Geneva to sort of unblock this uh, deadline. <coughs> Klaus, can I ask, I ask you? Richard, Richard said, uh, you know, if in this uh, uh, space of the uh, trade development nexus, if it was easy, it would have been it would have been done already. Uh, you spoke about the, uh, the Bali Agreement, uh, but it strikes me here we're getting into, regardless of how, you know, uh, which uh, countries alert us to which part of the Bali Agreement they're going to uh, implement, that we're into very, very tough, uh, difficult, detailed work of capacity building, uh, project by project, uh, trying to break down some of these trade barriers. So these are very difficult to get a handle on in a global sense. Uh, they're country by country and region by region. Are there some tools or some instruments that national governments and multilateral should be looking to build out here uh, to try and help us get a handle on this? Tools that could bring the government sector, public sector, official sector, and the private sector together. What's, what's the next, you know, we're trying to keep track of how much progress has been made here and where the opportunities are. It's not clear to me yet that we have a complete collection of uh, toolkit available for this. 
Well, actually, one of the things that I noticed when, uh, when we started this uh, global practice is uh, an inventory of the toolkit is very, very important. I think a lot of uh, what is driving the discussion and, in fact, the growing consensus is actually a, a very strong data set. Um, I, I, I don't want to enumerate all of it, but I think there must be at least 20 or 30 different uh, uh, data tools around in terms of diagnosing this. And I know that the uh, uh, Global Express Association has uh, phenomenal uh, uh, data collection tools in terms of actually identifying sort of where the spots are. And I think that's really important, not to sort of get hung up on ideology, but really be driven by data. Uh, in fact, yesterday there was a very interesting dinner of the trade community in, uh, in Washington, and uh, Lord and behold, not surprisingly, the uh, overwhelming uh, two, two recommendations, one was we need something like the Doing Business Index for trade, and the other one is we need a, a, a real global coalition of uh, MNCs as well as SMEs to actually uh, have a dialogue continuously with the bank in terms of where those areas actually are, because our sense is uh, governments are incredibly willing. I mean, this is really a coalition of the willing to move forward. The stories are incredibly compelling. Uh, when you go and uh, um, have a discussion in about two days between the Port Authority in Mombasa and the, uh, uh, the administration in Kigali, and you can basically see that over the course of uh, a very few months, the uh, transportation clearance time has gone down from 15 days to five days. You know that that is something that everyone actually wants to participate in and wants to actually see benefit from. Uh, so I would say those are the three things. One is the stories themselves. The evidence is very compelling. I think the data is really driving this, and um, I think that there is almost like an overwhelming demand. I mean, even, even if there are a lot of technical issues that need to be sorted out, the demand for the capacity building is really, actually every, everyone is benefiting from the window that, that needs to be there, because we are not just looking at the legal compliance, we're really talking about uh, being ready for taking this forward. Virginia, I was going to go back to you because you started with the discussion of the uh, OECD study, the data sources, and, uh, and, uh, and, and at the beginning of the opportunity here. Going forward from the Bali Agreement through the trade facilitation piece, do you have a view on the, on the, uh, on the toolkit that we're developing here and, and, and where the big opportunities might be? Well, I think picking up on the one thing that Klaus said is is the need to have the, the private sector in, involved in this. And um, certainly from the USA perspective, the, f the first thing that we did in terms of a toolkit is we have put out a, a sequencing guide that takes the provisions of the agreement and puts them into three different categories in terms of how we see sequencing interventions related to the agreement. I think having that overarching discussion is really important because we've certainly seen historically that some of these interventions, if you do one before the other, you really have to undo the first one when you come in to do the second one. You know, the old analogy of you pave the road, but then you figure out you have to put pipes underneath. So it, um, we're very concerned about that. And, and, but again, I think that's where the private sector comes in so heavily. And for us, we have decided that the current toolkits and the toolkits we've used in the past aren't what we really need. We have to embark in a different way, a new model to deliver assistance. We've already heard a lot about it um, from the minister today, and certainly USAID uh, is in the same boat, that the landscape is different, and we have to turn now and partner with the private sector. And we also have to engage with non-traditional donors that are already in the space and bring everyone together. So we're looking to create, and I know for those of you who read Dan's paper in the folder, a trade facilitation alliance, that this would be our, our go-to tool for uh, trade facilitation and in, in this area. Most of you know that USAID has been embarking on this kind of effort. We launched a new global lab this summer related to science and technology. In the next panel, you'll hear more about that. We've embarked on several grand challenges, um, which take what the best that the private sector has to offer. Uh, I would encourage all of you to uh, Google or Bing or whatever search engine you use, um, Grand Challenge and Ebola, to see the latest Grand Challenge that came out this week um, to fight Ebola. But these are the new models that we want to embark on related to trade facilitation. We do think that the time is right, and this is a particular area that the private sector is interested in because, as I said earlier, they are the ones moving the goods. They are the ones with the real information on the ground of what needs to be done in the sequencing. 
No, I'd, I'd, I'd like to, to follow sorry, up on what... Sorry, I thought that question was directed Virgin. to me. Was it... Yeah. No, it was. It was. Okay, it, sorry. No, no it, it really was. And uh, I saw Daniel just came back in the room, and I think he'd be disappointed if I didn't mention uh, the database, the GEA database. And, um, and, and what I'm going to talk about in a minute, if you're interested in taking a look at it, you can go to uh, www.global-express.org. So it's global-express.org. You know, as I said earlier, uh, we're one of four companies that are part of the Global Express Association. So towards the tail end of last year, uh, we launched an initiative to try to assess the capabilities of customs around the globe. And uh, so we used our members, all four of our members, and we looked at 139 countries. We started this, in essence, it was a survey given to our own members, to our, our four companies, to go out and really understand what the capabilities of customs are in those 139 countries that we worked on. Uh, we had a peer-to-peer -peer review after the series was done, so you can imagine we chopped the world up into four sections, and each one of us kind of took on a particular part of the, the world. And once we filled out the survey, we put it in front of our, our peers, and we scrubbed it a little bit better. And then uh, we, we published, through the GEA, published the results of the survey uh, back in the end of the first quarter of this year. And one of the things that we also did is we made sure that we notified the customs agencies in the 139 countries, here's what we think is going on. You can take a look at it and let us know if you agree or disagree with us. And uh, in a positive sense, we did get quite a bit of feedback and we were pretty much online. Now, what does this customs capability database show you, the 139 countries? Well, when we launched this uh, survey, it was prior uh, to the Bali agreement coming out. Uh, so what you're gonna find is that we ask questions that mirror quite a few of the trade facilitation agreements. And which was a nice thing, because now we had a benchmark to kind of look at which countries we feel uh, have some of the capabilities that are in the trade facilitation agreement and which ones still have a ways to go. Uh, I'll give you an example of some of the key performance indicators that we looked at. There are three that I just want to talk to. Uh, I think Article 7.1 is pre-arrival processing. When you take a look at the 139 countries that we surveyed, we saw that 65 of those countries don't have that capability, or they're not asking for electronic pre-clearance for goods entering a particular country. So that's a good indicator of a, a key powerful area to start. Another one of the articles, 7.4, uh, 7.4 on risk assessment, we found that 77 countries don't do any type of uh, automated electronic risk assessment of goods coming into their country. And if you just kind of compare the first two that I talked about, that means there's, there's probably, you know, 12 countries out there that do get the electronic information, but they're not utilizing it for risk assessment. And it's just an indicator of, of where there may be opportunities. <coughs> and then perhaps one more to take a look at would be on the de minimis level, and even though it's, I think it was 7.8 in the uh, trade facilitation agreement, you know, wasn't an obligation, but it was a best endeavor language. Uh, of those 139 countries, there were about 48 of them that did not have a, a set de minimis level. And uh, de minimis is important. If I were to go back and and, and kind of talk about, you know, when, as an industry, when we look at trade facilitation, if I could just put a picture in your mind, just kind of hold that up for a minute, picture in your mind, think of an hourglass. And the reason I say think of an hourglass is because it's trade facilitation challenges are all those things that would go into the middle section of that hourglass. And if you can think of four or five key things that we take a look at when we think of trade facilitation, one of the first one is a de minimis level. We want to make sure that there's a commercially meaningful de minimis that's set out there. You know, we've taken a look at, at what it takes to collect revenue dollars. And at some of the lowest de minimis levels, or, or with low de minimis thresholds, uh, you know, there's, there's a process and a cost to collect duties and taxes. And that process and costs are just passed on to the end consumer. So what we're finding is that at, at the lower levels, we're almost charging $3 to collect $1 in revenue. In other words, the, the cost of the goods are so low that the revenue that's collected is so little when you apply the de minimis uh, charge to it, the fee, that it, it doesn't make sense to have these lower de minimis thresholds out there. So that's one of the things that we've uncovered. So commercially meaningful de minimis is important. Electronic preclearance processing is vitally important. You know, a couple others would be the single windows that many of the countries are standing up. We see that as an important solution to widen that gap in the hourglass. Uh, uh, certainly timely release uh, is adopt, timely release of, uh, of goods is, uh, you know, just adopted WCO guidelines for timely release we think would be important. And I guess I'd, I'd have to throw into the mix, into that, that pinch point would be border harmonization of security processes. You know, since 2010, there's been a lot of focus 
uh, with customs agencies and border agencies around the globe to make sure that risk assessment's being done. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful programs out there. The key thing is to make sure that, that they're recognized from one country to the next, truly recognized to allow you know, some simplification of the regulations. We know that they need to be there, but we think that, you know, again, from our perch, we see all these wonderful programs. But when companies have to register in each individual country for these programs, it becomes a challenge. And most of them are very common. We know that there can be some harmonization to bring these together. And I'll wrap it up with this. That, you know, we're finding that there is a real significant relationship between trade flows to and from countries and the customs capability of those countries. There are some real significant relationships that as you implement some of these trade facilitation measures, you will see trade grow. And, and I know that sounds anecdotal, but I think uh, you'll see some studies coming out pretty soon that shows there are some real significant correlations that show um, that as you move one lever, you're going to see trade flow. And that's, uh, that's what's really good about this capability index. It's uh, a wonderful tool, and I think it can help us provide, you know, some stakeholder and on-the-ground views of what we think and where the needle can go. Thank you. Well, that's a very uh, uh, focused agenda there. Uh, actually, and I'm de minimis takes me back to my uh, Canadian uh, government days uh, where we had uh, issues on the de minimis side ourselves. Uh, David, um, if I could ask you to turn your mind to the uh, policy agenda here, um, obviously not on the uh, 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 same uh, sector of the business as, uh, as UPS, and I doubt that any of Bombardier's equipment goes through in a de minimis rule uh, when you're moving uh, entire train uh, systems, but is there, are there pieces of the, of the public agenda here internationally that you could see moving to help remove some barriers from Bombardier's own growth in developing countries and to make it easier for uh, for some of your customers in the developing world uh, to take advantage of the transportation products you're producing? Well, I think from our perspective, uh, trade facilitation is, is absolutely key. Um, from a manufacturing perspective, one, I think, as you would think, uh, in terms of market access for our products, uh, but perhaps more importantly for this venue is, uh, you know, I talked a bit about um, our focus on, on developing local presence and local roots. Uh, when we go into a country, um, you know, we're looking at uh, developing uh, you know, a manufacturing site or, or other type of site like we are right now in Morocco and, and Brazil. Um, you know, one of the key important factors for that site, the success of that site, and ultimately the economic impact it's going to have locally in terms of a development perspective, um, is our ability to support that site. I mean, every site we have, manufacturing site we have, builds products uh, that are complex and builds products in conjunction with other sites that are uh, far flung around the world. Um, so for example, we have planes that have components coming from Belfast, from Morocco, from Mexico, uh, coming to Canada or to the United States for final assembly. So uh, very important for us uh, to be able to make sure that that manufacturing network is indeed integrated um, and running smoothly, but also the value chains and supply chains that support it uh, across borders. Uh, um, so when our CEO thinks in terms of markets, he thinks in terms of nationalities, uh, but he also thinks in terms of manufacturing hubs. Uh, basically, how do we support this site here in this country? How does our chain supply chain support it? How does our manufacturing network engage with it? You know, can we make this work from an operations perspective? Because in today's competitive environment, just-in-time manufacturing is key. So we have to be able to get components, products, uh, human expertise, uh, those kinds of things crossing borders in a streamlined fashion. So for us, when we look at, um, uh, when we're searching for a place to put uh, some kind of a facility, we are definitely looking at the things you would think about, tax incentives and uh, you know, market opportunity and that sort of thing. But we're also looking very much at how well we can do business uh, and function uh, as an entity in that country. And with that comes all the trappings of locating a plant or a service facility there. Uh, you have clusters that uh, arise uh, with uh, uh, suppliers, uh, so you build a supplier cluster. You have training activities that support the local workforce and, and develop a workforce pool. So there are, are there's a ripple effect uh, for when we go into a country. And the success and uh, or lack thereof is very much determined on trade policy in that country and how that country, how we're able to supply those sites uh, from other sectors around the world. So you know, I would say trade facilitation is a huge thing for us. Um, 
again, because of market access, as you would think, but also from that perspective. Klaus, can I ask you, going back to my days at, uh, at uh, IDB here in uh, D.C., the trade facilitation projects were amongst the most difficult, complicated projects to undertake at the bank, and for obvious reasons. You're dealing with bilateral or regional political arrangements. Uh, the financing was uh, it could be difficult to arrange, trying to find the corporate structures or the organizational structures to make it work was, uh, was difficult. And then, of course, these go on over a period of uh, long periods of time with uh, payoffs uh, in, uh, in, on the same uh, uh, time order of magnitude here. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what uh, uh, multilaterals and others might be able to do to try and resolve these twin challenges, the, the political organizational challenge of organizing the projects, planning them and executing them, and compare that to the financing challenges involved. Money may not be, you know, the dollar values here are not uh, uh, enormous uh, uh, dollar values, but nonetheless, because of the payoff cycle here, they can have their own financing challenge. How do you see the balance between these uh, twin, twin challenges of delivering on these types of projects? I, I was, uh, I feel tempted to sort of say, well, uh, maybe things have changed. Um, because in, in some way, when you look at sort of the portfolio of what we have as uh, trading competitiveness, um, we have a very small lending portfolio. Um, and I think what that really speaks to is the agility that we bring to, uh, to this whole agenda is actually our ability to work with partners, uh, to uh, be able to mobilize trust funds very quickly, uh, and to actually have a very strong link to the country demand. So I have, I mean, in the first, like I said, it's, uh, it's pretty phenomenal to sort of say this trade facilitation uh, support uh, facility that we set up was uh, three months old. Um, we have talked with USADs, with other partners. We have now 30 country requests. We have teams on the ground. Um, so, in I, so as far as I can tell, there is a, there's a ready market and a ready ability to respond to this. Uh, so on the, on the analytic and on the capacity building side, I don't really, uh, I have not encountered this. Um, obviously where uh, things become more complicated are when, when these are really sort of breakthrough transformation projects. And I just wanted to mention one of them is uh, the Great Lakes Initiative where this is one of the, the signature, uh, um, I think, almost political initiatives to sort of see how we can actually tie these different markets together. And there, uh, yes, it is true. This is a truly multi-sectoral challenge. You have to bring uh, not just trade facilitation, but hard infrastructure in there, capacity building. You have a lot of political synchronization that needs to happen. Uh, and I, I would say on those type of operations, yes, we are looking at probably two or three years worth of, uh, of preparation time. The political economy, I think, is very favorable, uh, at least as far as I can tell, because we have really put such a spotlight on it. Uh, there's, uh, there's ongoing discussions with, I think, Jim Kim, Ban Ki-moon, others, uh, to actually promote this forward. So I would say the political support is clearly there. Um, as far as sort of the, um, the organ, sort of the internal organization is concerned, that's a very interesting question, because that's really where this whole um, um, internal reorganization has to show whether it's really uh, uh, able to deliver. Um, and I can tell you one of the very first discussions that we have is from the trade competitiveness practice to talk to the transport uh, folks, because that's really our sort of partner in crime, if you will, across and within the bank. Uh, another partner in crime is very clearly IFC, uh, to really understand where they are actually seeing the, uh, the business development opportunities and the investment. Those are sort of conversations that I can assure you we did not have before. Uh, so I would I mean, literally, I mean, I've been in the bank for 25 years. I can tell you trade was not necessarily my brief before coming. Now it has really changed and really opened my mind. And I think that is really the type of capability that we need much more of, and I think that will make us much more agile to actually respond to that. So I'm, I'm very optimistic in terms of both handling the, uh, the organizational issue as well as the financing challenge. I have not seen this. I would say there's one, one interesting part, which uh, is sort of maybe a counterintuitive way of, uh, of answering this. Um, over the last three months, we have gone out and we have met with many country directors, bilateral donors, uh, government agencies, the demand for this trade competitiveness nexus is huge. Uh, so for us, the challenge is not in terms of uh, just growing by multiples, which would be very simple to do. You can't do this in an international organization, as you well know. Uh, so for us, the question is, what is actually the metric for figuring out what are the most impactful uh, activities? And I think that's where we will have to apply a much tighter filter. 
I also think that we have to work differently with uh, other organizations. So the, the mindset that it is us that are actually delivering this, I think, is passé. So we need to really figure out working with associations, with other implementation partners is much more important going forward. Thanks. Well, just following up on what, what Klaus said, I, th I think it is important to acknowledge that, that we need to work dif differently among ourselves, among the donor group, which, and I continue to go back to say that is what AID uh, is striving to do. I think particularly in the trade facilitation space, we are fighting, I would say it's just the perception and not the reality, but we are fighting the perception that we aren't coordinated. And we, we do talk about this quite a bit because in the development world, it's very interesting if you take any issue, and we've just seen it with Ebola and global health. The question is, is everybody organized in global health in development? The answer, we all know the answer to that. The answer is no, we just saw it play out. Well, trade, it, all of a sudden in trade, because of the Bali deal and because of, of section two of that agreement that says that donors uh, need to work together, suddenly we're in the spotlight. Everyone's expecting us to instantly be coordinated, talking among each other, and by the way, bringing in the private sector. So I think this is a huge challenge for us, but I think we're all ready for it. As Klaus said, and as you acknowledged in your comments, um, time is moving on. Things are changing. We're in a completely different realm now in development. So I think that's, that's um, certainly where USAID is at. We, I, I just wanted to say something about the um, Trade Facilitation Support Fund when Klaus uh, named the donors. Actually, the U.S. was the original donor, and Canada came in right after that. So I want to get a plug in there for that. Exactly, exactly. But, but I, I, I think that's really important to show, and it, it is what, exactly what Klaus said. Why did we do that? Even though we're saying we want to build this trade facilitation alliance and public-private partnership, we were the initial contributors to the IFC fund because we knew they could stand up quickly, which is exactly what he just said. And we do feel like there has to be, for us as well as other bilateral donors, and I know Canada feels the same way because we've been in discussions with them, we have to have a menu, albeit a small menu, of options that we can um, use or tools that we can call on to support countries as they come forward and ask for requests. So uh, the IFC fund is one, but I think that's allowing us then um, as a donor community to, to have more concerted efforts and more coordination, which has been, I think, by everyone's estimation, sorely lacking in the past. Well, let me ask you about that then, because <coughs> this is one area in development where uh, the resources are clearly there, and the demand is clearly there. Uh, the combination of ODA and official resources and private sector resources, maybe there's <clears throat> some coordination there to work out. But talk about this menu of options then. We know that the data resources are, are coming online. Uh, Rich talked about a checklist of issues uh, that need to be, that, uh, that, uh, that that his organization, the Global Express organization, is focused on in terms of <clears throat> trying to see where the customs organizations are and facilitating this. What kind of menu do you say? What, what from your perspective, would be a, 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 a promising uh, project, a promising initiative to undertake, and what would that menu look like? Virginia. I thought you were directing that to Rich. Um, well, for us, again, it's the Trade Facilitation Alliance. We are we're putting that together. We, um, we, kn we know that everyone has been talking about partnering with the private sector. It's not a new idea. I mean, we, we have done some of that in our value chain work. Uh, in West Africa, for example, we supported the African Cashew Alliance, the Global Shea Alliance, which required us to work with the private sector. We worked with Nestle, Unilever, Hershey's, Costco. But we haven't, we haven't then, they were purchasing the products, and we were essentially on the donor side supporting all of the um, producers in the country. We haven't gone that next step to really bring the private sector in in terms of project design and what should really be done to give them a seat essentially on the board to say, no, 
development people, you may have normally done it this way, and, but this is what's really going to uh, flip the switch, pull the lever, whatever the case may be, that's going to, to make trade flow. There's just many things that from the official donor perspective, we just don't have the answers to. And that's why for us, an alliance, a true public-private partnership that brings the private sector to the table to be involved in that project design is really where we should move in, in this space. And, and that's really what we're embarking on. Thanks. Yeah, I'd be happy to uh, comment on this. Uh, you know, one of the, I guess, I guess when you, when I, earlier when I said it's not going to be easy, I think that uh, one of the things we're going to have to do is look for those early adopters, look for those countries, uh, and they have to be meaningful and impactful early adopters. Uh, and I think that's going to be some of the tough decisions, uh, you know, that governments that fund these projects are going to have to make decisions on. You can't take care of everybody at once, but you got to identify those countries uh, that have the political courage, that can make an impact, and that can stay focused on trade facilitation. There, you know, there are many important projects out there, uh, some very social, some of them uh, infrastructure, but there, there's some that you really got to have that laser focus on trade facilitation. If you don't do that, uh, all the well intentions, and I love Virginia's example, you know, you, you pave the road and then you got to tear it up to put the pipes in. That's going to happen. You're going to see, uh, it, it, earlier there was discussions uh, on the small and medium and enterprises and, and the small companies. I mean, it's going to be so important to keep them in mind as we move forward with these trade implementation. You have to have the stakeholders at the table. I uh, certainly hope that our industry can be at that table to help provide some insights and in our findings on what impactful trade facilitation is going to look like. But we know it's not going to be easy. I don't, you know, I don't envy being in the position of making a decision of which countries we're going to address now and which ones are going to have to wait until we get these early adopters up and running. Um, when you talk about what are some of the specific areas you can focus in on, you know, I, one of the key drivers uh, when you look through that trade facilitation agreement certainly is this electronic preclearance and this electronic submission of information and bringing border agencies and customs, you know, modernization to the forefront. And, you know, there ought to be some synergies with that. When you find needs that are very common across different countries, you know, solutions ought to be developed that can be not so much plug and play, but where they can adapt and, and, and climb right on board and, and uh, become part and, and see their modernization efforts advance. So I, you know, I think that it's going to take those type of efforts, those types of focus. Uh, one of the things that Virginia said, uh, you know, the relationships that maybe donors have with particular countries, you know, the deep relationships they have, they're going to have to look at things a little bit differently and work with trade ministers and work with customs officials to really find out what it is that's got to be developed and implemented to see, uh, to see this really do what it can do. And it's going to get done. I mean, I think Secretary General Azevedo and the the Geneva team, they're going to find a way to get this thing moving. I really, truly believe. I don't know when it's going to happen. I know that uh, they hope to continue to meet this month, but uh, this is going to move. And even if it doesn't, there's going to be opportunities to, to enhance trade facilitation. Klaus, this is getting to be a hopeful note here. <clears throat> you talked about uh, uh, the, the challenges of ramping up the World Bank efforts here and the multilateral efforts here. Obviously, we can't triple and quadruple the size in the space of six months in a multilateral operation. Uh, Richard just talked about uh, the need for the impactful early adopters here. We're moving down the same line here. If you look ahead, let's say, we talk about early adopters here. Let's look down two or three years, maybe five years out. Uh, what what are we looking for for the early adopters? Uh, what do they look like? I'm not talking about individual countries. I think we're too early to talk about that. But uh, what would what 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 would a partner have to look like in order to be in those in that early adopter group to attract World Bank and other early attention? And then what would others have to be working on in order to be in the next tranche uh, where there's just a little bit more work to do before we can flick the switch from, or give the go ahead, the green light for the project. Because what is it, as you try to pull together this new organization, this new team within the, uh, the World Bank, uh, you must have given some thought to this. What, what will the early projects look like and what will need to be done to move the next tranche of projects through? <coughs> I mean, I have, to, uh, I have to acknowledge that the questions is way better than my answer is going to be, so thank you very much. <laughs> uh, um, very thoughtful. Um, but, I mean, based on sort of what I've seen, what I've learned in the, in the last, uh, in the first three months is, 
obviously, you know, there, there are two sort of separate tracks. The one is uh, somewhat opportunistically very quickly to stand up, which is the trade facilitation window. I think there, you know, clearly we are driven by demand. We'll have to see 30 different assessments will obviously generate a whole lot of data set. I think the, uh, the criteria that were laid out here, we want to see countries that are really committed where there is a, a longer term impact. It's a, it's, a, it's a very wide variety of countries that are, that are really pledging for this uh, uh, assessment support. When it comes down to sort of the way the bank actually operates in a sort of more traditional way, uh, I can only tell you sort of where I've picked up very strong demand is uh, in Africa, East, uh, East, uh, particularly uh, uh, East Africa. Um, we have uh, a very complex uh, startup operation on the ECOWAS countries. Um, I see a very strong demand in South Asia. In fact, it's, it's almost crying out for, for doing something on this one, very closely linked to the, the whole political transformation process. Uh, there's a very interesting agenda, actually, when it comes down to uh, um, uh, the India agenda, uh, which is not just, uh, you, know, it's, you know, we have sort of termed this uh, India actually integrating with itself uh, and then regional integration. Um, huge demand in East Asia, uh, just phenomenal uh, in, in terms of the, the whole possibilities that we have, and we have very long-standing uh, operations in uh, uh, Laos and Cambodia. Uh, so those are just some of the hotspots that I see where it's, there, there's a very, very strong demand uh, from, from our side. And since you mentioned uh, um, uh, Robert Acevedo, I mean, it's, it's no coincidence that he's actually here uh, tomorrow uh, at, a, at a panel at the bank to, uh, to address this. And I was... Uh, last week in, uh, in Geneva and in Brussels, and uh, I thought he really captured this perfectly. Trade matters to everyone. So I think that is really the, 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 the mantra that we have to pretty much all get behind in order to actually make this work. I think what we would like to illustrate uh, much more compellingly is that this is really uh, uh, an agenda that is very closely linked to, I think, what you mentioned, uh, the inclusiveness um, part. We need to make sure that we are not caught in a, a corner that this is only uh, relevant and, and of benefit to multinationals. I think there's a, a business model challenge that uh, I think we want to see pushed much more uh, SMEs connected, connected directly to consumers. So I, I would say that space around innovation, we, are not, we haven't even touched. So I think we have to really open our minds to some very uh, different and much more innovative ways of thinking about this. So the link to entrepreneurship that is also part of our practice to innovation, I think is, is pretty critical. I'm not sure that Anyway, this was sort of my improvised answer to your fantastic question. So uh, what I see is really, um, I mean, I clearly see geographically very strong uh, emphasis. Uh, I do see that a lot more needs to be done in terms of then connecting this to entrepreneurship, business models, and so on. So. Wants to grow? Oh, ab absolutely. <laughs> I, think, you know, I think it's where our, you know, it, we'll grow where our customers grow. And I, I think not just for us, but for our industry. But yes, those are... Very interesting. Well, that's good. That's good. <laughs> Look, I'm mindful, uh, Dan, here of trying to keep our uh, project on uh, or our program on uh, on schedule here today. But uh, I think this has been a persuasive uh, discussion of uh, of uh, the opportunities here, and I have the very strong sense of being on the verge of an extraordinary amount of progress in the next couple of years. I'm happy to take some closing comments from folks, though. If we'd like to start with Virginia. Thanks. Well, certainly the, the Bali package has um, presented us with a, an interesting opportunity, a Agreed. great opportunity. The, and the way the trade facilitation agreement was structured, it, it, it is the first time that really at the WTO it brings trade and development together. I think we need to seize the moment, move forward. Again, this is an area we've been working on for many, many years, but, but we have an opportunity to proceed in a new and different way in partnership with the private sector. Thanks. Well, from our perspective, uh, for us, uh, that nexus between trade uh, and uh, business opportunity um, is really critical uh, based, again, on the, on the nature of our business. Um, I think we're very interested in getting involved. I think there, you know, the discussion today has been quite positive given that uh, I think there is value that uh, the private sector can bring uh, uh, to the discussion, uh, if only from a uh, here's what we've experienced in the past kind of uh, perspective. Uh, so we're, uh, we're actually quite uh, interested in that. And uh, so uh, thank you for a very useful discussion today. Appreciate it. A couple <coughs> comments. Uh, you know, we, we, one of the, the interesting things Virginia said earlier, she talked about the 47, 48 countries have already submitted their eight commitments. Uh, and we have an opportunity now to take a look at those. And if, if you run that list up against, when I earlier I talked about a, a customs capability database that we took a look yeah. at, 
You know, one of the challenges that we're finding, and, it, and it, it, we kind of anticipated it, and I don't know what the answer or the solution is, but, you know, some of the A commitments, meaning that they're implement, they're now, they're up to speed right now, when you bump those up against the, the capability database that we have, we don't, agree, we don't quite see the same alignment. So I think that's going to be one area going down to the, in the future that we'll have to look for a path to how, you know, we can, you know, can help point that out. And, and that leads to the next comment, which is, you know, give us an opportunity as stakeholders to, to lend our expertise in the area to, to help show what, you know, what good might be looking like elsewhere. And it's, it's certainly not to, to point out that there's a wrong. It's to say there's, there's other things going on around the globe or maybe in the area that you can adopt that are really going to help you uh, facilitate trade in your country. If I had to leave you with one closing comment, just remember this, that when it's easier to trade, you know, more trade happens. And I think that that shows what the power of border modernization, customs modernization is all about. Thank you. Well, I mean, the first comment is obviously, uh, since I'm uh, a newcomer to this whole area after about 20 years, it's not, it doesn't feel any more like your parents' uh, trade, trade facilitation, facilitation discussion from uh, 10 or 15 years ago. I think there's um, um, uh, two or three things that I see. The first one is uh, it is for us very closely linked to what we are about as a development organization. So the nexus is very powerful. Uh, the opportunity to link with the private sector across the board, across the spectrum is there. And the other one is uh, we didn't talk about it that much. Maybe the next panel will address this, is the possibility for leapfrogging. Uh, I think there's, uh, there's a lot that can be done maybe uh, in, in unconventional and different ways. And I think that's where the, the selection of these pilots and as you very correctly said, the, uh, the selection criteria to where the gaps actually are. Um, and I think that's sort of, I see uh, really a, a very sophisticated and very quick process of, of coming to terms with that. Um, so this is not a random search. Great. Well, thank you very much for that uh, fascinating and encouraging discussion in a, in a field where some of the discussions are not uh, uh, always quite so optimistic and upbeat. And I think we started here with a with an optimistic and upbeat discussion. Let me thank, uh, on behalf of everyone here, the, uh, the panelists for their time. And Dan, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna use the microphone for this. Thank you very much. I think when you, you get into the nitty gritty of this topic, you think, oh boy, de minimis this and um, uh, computerized that. It's, it's, you have to understand that there is a trillion dollars with a T of additional trade. If you could fix the plumbing, this issue of trade facilitation, if you could fix the plumbing at the border in developing countries, there's $500 billion of more trade for developed countries and $500 billion more for developing countries. But it's not necessarily a question of money, as there was, we alluded to here and Ian was able to pull out. It's, it's about uh, a question of information, and some of that's provided by data such as the Global uh, Freight Forwarders Association's database that Rich talked about. Uh, but I think we're gonna need to go farther, and this is an opportunity for donors to help do, do a better job of getting this data and cross-referencing what's happening in Geneva at the negotiations and what's happening actually on the ground with customs and crosswalking that. Because even though some negotiators think they're going to deliver their governments, um, getting these sorts of changes through are politically difficult. And they are also deal with sometimes corruption issues. It's not an inefficiency issues. And so it's a question of political will. So it's, some of it's about a data problem. And that's a role for donors like Canada or, or the World Bank to build such a thing, or maybe an organization like CSIS. But then it's a question of discerning who's actually really got the political will to actually follow that through. Some of that's gonna be discerned by donors at the field level. Some of that's gonna be discerned by companies who are gonna say, you know what, they're saying X, Y, Z in Geneva, but when I go back uh, on the ground, my reality is this. And that's why this data that Rich was talking about is so important. So big trade and a big development opportunity, and it requires data requires a little bit of foreign aid, not a lot. The World Bank estimates it's about $20 million a country. And then it requires uh, political will. And it's about the politics of this, which is the particularly challenging thing. But, so, and we need to get ready, because we are going to have a trade, trade facilitation is, agreement. It's coming, if you're following this stuff as a trade person. And so we need to pivot from a trade negotiation paradigm to a diplomacy and development implementation paradigm. And development agencies like AID or the World Bank aren't gonna be able, or Canadians, Canada's DFAT are not gonna be able to do it alone. They're gonna require part, new kinds of partnerships with 
Bombardier, UPS, FedEx, other companies um, that are here, but also that, are, that aren't here as well. So thanks again for doing this. Thanks a lot, um, Ian, for that very interesting um, conversation that we just had. We're gonna have, we're gonna now shift to a conversation with, on the role of science and technology uh, in the implications for public policy. I'm gonna ask the panelists to come on up, please. Rich is here and, and some other